Good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On this show, you guys are going to learn a little bit about the Real Estate Investing Club. We're going to have a conversation with a fellow podcast host who's done over 200 interviews about real estate investing and all sorts of cool things. So, ladies and gentlemen, fellow deal makers, let's welcome Gabe to the show. Gabe, welcome. Josh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, dude. So, uh, before we hit record, we kind of nerded out on equipment and Mac and PC and this kind of mic and that kind of mic. So I love talking to fellow podcasters. So thrilled to have you here. But uh, Gabe, kind of give us an idea. You know, if, if you and I were having coffee and someone came up and they go, hey, Gabe, I'm Bob, whatever. Who are you? What do you do? How do you typically respond? Perfect. Yeah, the, the thousand foot view. Um, so the Real Estate Investing Club is the podcast. I absolutely love doing it. It's kind of a passion project. But the the main business is actually real estate. Um, you know, real estate investing is what we do. We do commercial real estate. And uh, it's mobile home parks and self storage facilities. Um, you know, I'm not specific on those. Those are just the two that I'm going after. But uh, pretty much anything commercial is what what we're going for. Cool. Um, you don't look like an old fella, right? Like, so a lot of the guys who I talk to who are real estate investors, you know, they have a lot of gray hair. You still have dark hair. You know, how did you get into this game? How long you've been in the game? Oh man, it has been a journey. Uh, I, I don't know how deep you want to go into this, but, um, I, you know, I graduated with a degree in philosophy, so I couldn't really do much with that. I was going to go to law school, but, um, you know, followed some lawyers and I was like, that's not the life for me. So I decided to go a different route, jumped into corporate um, as a management consultant, you know, spent some years there, but really didn't like it. Um, in about 2000, I think 14, 15, um, you know, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to start my own thing. And so I started doing things, you know, I didn't, I didn't exactly know what I was going to do. And so I just started doing things, you know, I was scrolling through my feed um, and I'd get that, that ad that says, Hey, make a million dollars, e-commerce, make a million dollars, digital marketing, whatever. I jumped on all of them. I started an e-commerce store, um, got it up to like 20, 25,000 a month, which was great in total revenue, not, not profit. Um, and then jumped into digital marketing, but I didn't like any of that stuff and I was still working. Uh, so it was just needed to find something to do. Eventually I, uh, I saw something about flipping. Um, and so I got a house. Bought a house in 2014, 15 um, in Tacoma, a triplex, and I flipped that. Uh, made like eighty thousand, which was the most I'd ever seen at the time. You know, in one chunk, and uh, that the rest is history. Wow, so cool! All right, so you were you were out to study philosophy. Kind of yeah. give us some ideas, right? So the, on the show, we get to know a little bit about the deal maker, the story that helps create the deal maker. Why philosophy? Tell me, tell me your thoughts on that. Why did I choose that? Yeah. Um, I really liked Aristotle um, when I was when I was you know younger in in my teens. I really liked Aristotle reading it. Um, Ayn Rand, you know, I, I hate to say it now, but I really liked reading Ayn Rand back then. Um, and I just I just liked it. I, I liked how you know creating a logical system and kind of applying it to life. I really like ethics in in philosophy and how you can live a really good life. Um, and so that's where I went. I decided that you know I didn't didn't really have a, a goal besides being a lawyer in college. And so that was the, I just went with what I liked um, and philosophy is it. And, and that's, you know, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. Now, so, all right. So you were going to school and, you know, studying philosophy and the meaning of what's the meaning of life and the meaning of how to live and, and all these thoughts. And then you started seeing attorneys and you're like, I'm going down this path. Maybe this isn't for me. And then you also did that in the corporate world. Maybe this isn't for me. Right. What did you see that just didn't fit for you? And I, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and I asked this question. So why didn't it fit? What did you see about yourself? Yeah, for um, for being a lawyer, I really I mean, I like philosophy. I like creating arguments and, and talking about and discussing things. Um, so that's what I thought being a lawyer was, is, which is really being, you know, a, a trial lawyer. Um, but I started following what, you know, your general typical lawyer would do and what, what they do in the day to day. I, f I had a few friends who had already graduated. Um, I asked if they could come, if I could come and just kind of follow their job. And I watched, you know, I'd go and I'd watch them and I'd see what they did. And it was just very, they were just reviewing contracts. And it's just, it looked like it was a soul crushing job. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't see myself getting into that. And if there's lawyers reading this, I know that's not the full job. I know contract review is not like exactly what you guys do. You guys do a lot more, but 
it just, at the time it wasn't, it didn't fit what I wanted in life. I really wanted to create something. I wanted to like get out there, make an impact. Um, you know, I was, I was young, I had piss and vinegar, so I didn't want to do uh, law, but then once I made that decision, like, okay, I'm not going to be a lawyer. I was like, shit, now I actually have to make money because yeah. <laughs> I don't want to live with my parents. And so there's got to be, you know, I got to do something. Um, and I, I just didn't have an answer. And so I just started, my friend worked at Accenture, um, which is a consulting firm. And he was flying around, looked like he was having a little bit of fun. So I, I that's the route I went. And that was the next, you know, the next job. It wasn't really directed. Like I wasn't internally directed. It was just kind of something that looked fun and I made the jump. Um, but once I got into it, and started working corporate. Um, again, I, I was, I didn't really have freedom. And that's really what I, what I didn't like about corporate was it's very slow and you don't really have true creative freedom to, to make an impact. At least the jobs that I was doing, I was in uh, project management, business analysis, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I got in there and it just, it just wasn't for me. It took me seven years to leave corporate. And so I didn't like just, you know, jump right out, but, um, I did know that that wasn't where that wasn't the route that I wanted to go. What did you wear on a day-to-day -day basis when you were working in management consultant at Accenture? What did I wear? Yeah, what was your what was your outfit? So you I, your I mean, I'm in Seattle, and Seattle's like super super lax. Um, okay. So the typical uniform is jeans and a North Face. That is your okay. Seattle uniform. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. Now that you're a real estate investor, you know, like what what in a podcast host? What's a typical? What are you wearing right now? <laughs> that's a great question. Well, I got a shirt on. That's a good start. Um, no, Thank I just God. He's jeans and a pants. shirt, you know, okay. it's just, I, I'm pretty laid back. I, I don't dress up too often. Yeah. Cool. All right. So you did your first deal flipped, uh, you know, you're like, I should buy real estate. You flipped a, a, a piece of real estate and you, and you made 80 K. So you have 80 K in your bank account. What was the difference between the day before that? And then the day after that, when, when 80 K hit the bank account? Well, it was me and a friend. So I had half of, I think it was 84 K. So I had like 42 okay. K. Um, nice. yep. But the, uh, so the day after I flipped it, we sold it. I mean, the day after nothing really happened, I had the money and I, uh, I was just like, great, this is awesome. Now I have the money. Uh, I knew I liked the, what we did, but the problem with flipping, um, and I, you know, everybody, when they get into becoming, you know, they get into real estate, the, the first um, influence they usually have is something like HGTV, um, which is, you know, it, it's, I love those shows. They're awesome. I love their flips. You know, they're really beautiful, but that's not what flipping is like. Um, and in order to do flips, you have to have a lot of money. And I quickly, quickly ran into that realization is that 42,000 is not going to, it's not going to make enough money to, to create a business. Um, and so, you know, I had the money, and honestly, I don't remember exactly what I did with it all, but I know I, I kept a little bit to start uh, other, you know, other businesses. I did the e-commerce business, um, the digital marketing, and I just kept spinning my wheels until I was finally wholesaling really is what got me out of the uh, out of kind of the, the rut and to actually create a, create a business. But then, man, it's uh, when, when you start in, in real estate, it really is you got to find a way to have active income to make it a viable business. Um, if not, then you it's, it's tough. You can raise capital, but it's uh, it's really difficult to do. It's hard to raise capital when you need capital too. Have you found that? Yep. Yeah, you should definitely. And that's the thing that's, it's like a catch 22 is like in order to raise capital, you've already had to have done a number of deals. People want to see experience. They want to see that, you know, they can trust you with their money unless it's your mom and dad, you know, they're not going to just give, you know, Joe blow his money. And so you really have to have to get some sort of background. You got to, you got to start a podcast. You got to do a flip, do some, some wholesales. You have to have experience in order to raise money. Um, but in order to buy the deals, you have to have money. And so it's a, it's a catch 22 there. Which came first, the, the house, the deal or the capital? Oh, I love this question. Which came first, the capital or the deal? I had a guy in my men's Bible study, reach out to me. He's like, Hey, Josh, I, I want to do some real estate investing. Do you know anybody with money? And I'm like, yeah, I got people with money and hard money and this money and that money and red hat, blue hat. Yeah. The money's there. Do you have the deal? And he's like, mm. no, but if I had the money, I'd go get the deal. In your opinion, what for future real estate investors, what should they focus on first? Trying to line up relationships with money or trying to find good deals? What do you think? 
I think finding good deals is more important, um, but it is really hard to to find good deals when you don't have money because the the problem with that with not having money is you get into a headspace where you you can't really think super clearly. When you have a certain amount of money, you're able to sit back. You're like, I'm okay, everything's okay. I can analyze this correctly and make the right decisions. When you don't have the money, then you just start making mistakes. Um, and so I would say, you, you know, you got to find the deal first, but it's, it is good. You should probably do that while you have, you know, a runway, a, a monetary runway to work with. Yeah. The first deal that I did, I did a wholesale deal. I was knocking on doors and, you know, I read the book, how to buy houses with no money down by Carlton sheets. It was in a binder nice. and had cassette tapes, right? So <laughs> I'm probably a little older than you. But I, I was like, I listened to this and I was like, wait a second, I could buy a house without money because I didn't have money. And I knocked on a door and the lady said, yeah, I'm interested in selling. I flipped the contract on that, right? Signed the contract, flipped the contract, 14K. Like, hey, not bad. Not, not bad for, a, for yeah. a door knocker, right? Like knuckle dragon door knocker. Um, but in that, I had no money, but I, I found a good deal. And then I found the investor afterwards who, got, who I could flip the deal to. Um, as you see, you know, your first experience was a triplex that was 2014 ish. Uh, yeah, 20, I think it was 2014. Yeah. Okay. So you and I get to go back in time and have a conversation with a younger Gabe working, you know, at Accenture and he, he's walking around with his Norse face and he, he asked us for coffee and you could give the, the younger Gabe who's about to parlay into real estate, a piece of advice about real estate investing and where to start. What would you, what, what advice would you give that? Oof, that's tough. Uh, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, I, man, see, I so I was in Seattle and I live in Seattle, and Seattle is has been just in a phenomenal market. Um, and if I could go back to the game in 20, 2014, I would have said, you know, you have some money in your bank. I I had like I don't know nine thousand dollars or something like that. You know, enough to live, and then also some to do marketing. I would say, start start doing marketing, start sending letters, get as many houses as you can under contract and if, and just start raising capital to buy them. I, I would start, I would con, um, convince myself to do marketing first uh, because I feel like you do, you do have to find the deal. That is kind of where the real estate starts to open to you if you can get a, a pipeline. Um, but man, if I could have just purchased a number of just crappy houses in Seattle and held on to them for a few years, I would have made you know plenty of money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, you mentioned, you know, hunting for the deal and marketing and sending out letters, you know, now you, you guys have, you know, have done 200 interviews and you've probably done a few more deals since then. Now you're into commercial uh, real estate, focus on mobile home parks and self storage, right? Like how important and what are some of the things that you've learned about, you know, hunting for a deal? What are, what are some of the things that you've learned about yourself and through the hundreds of people that you've interviewed about how to find a good deal? in real estate. Yeah. 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 Um, no, that's a really good question. And so how to find a good deal of things I've learned. Number one is you got to stick to your strengths. Um, I, I just get drained when I'm on the phone and so cold calling for me, it just, it's not energy efficient. Um, and, it, but it's a really effective way to, to do marketing. And so you got to choose, a, a choose a method that is, that fits you. Um, so I found direct mail and text marketing to be, you know, that's my bread and butter. That's what works really well for me. Um, so that, that's something that I would prop. That's the biggest lesson learned. The next one is just, mar you know, getting leads is all about numbers. It's, I don't care how good you are at sales. It, it comes down to the number of leads you can actually bring in. Um, and that is just, it's, it's a volume game. So you gotta, you gotta get, uh, get a list, start marketing to it and just don't stop. Um, you think, you know, you'll get to a point, Oh, I just send out a thousand letters. I I've got, I'm, it's guaranteed that I'm going to get a house. Just that's not it. Think bigger, think like 10,000 letters. That's when you're going to get a house or you're going to get a good deal. Um, it's always more volume than you think. And so you gotta, you gotta err on the side of greater volume in marketing. So in your, in your past about how many deals have you done or given an idea of from the first deal to now, where have you evolved and what are some of the like the benchmarks that you've reached in your own personal life yeah so i i the 
my trajectory has been kind of similar to a lot of guys out there. Um, I did that first flip, but then I got into wholesaling. So I really feel like the wholesaling is where I, I really got started. I did like three or four of those. Um, and then I did two more flips and then I just jumped right into commercial. Um, so I bought two mobile home parks with some partners and then I bought four, um, self-storage facilities from that point. And that's where we're at today. We got four, we got two that we're trying to buy right now. Um, did that answer your question? I feel like I, I missed the piece there. Yeah, no, I think I think you got it. Sometimes when I ask the question, I forget about the question that I asked. So I'm glad you remember. <laughs> That's how it happens to me too. Yeah, I think I think we covered the question pretty good. You know, one thing that I've always uh, been interested in is on store storage uh, facilities, right? Like finding an old storage facility and then cracking up, you know, cracking open one of those storage things and seeing yeah, like an, an antique like truck in there, like. Does that ever happen to you? Like when you acquire a uh, self storage? It might. I just, uh, I, I don't take the time to go and, and look. Um, if there is, you know, a, a few of the, of this, um, facilities that I bought, they were pretty much vacant and, uh, but there was still a lot of units that were filled. Um, but I just, you know, it takes a lot of time to go through that stuff. And so I just said, if it's filled, dump it, it's not, you know, I'm not going to deal with it. And so. Um, I'm sure there were, you know, there might be some good stuff, but, uh, it's, you know, it's just too time intensive to go through it. Yeah. Like a model T, you know, an old Ford or something, I mean, like something super cool like that, or like, you know, Willie Mays rookie card or, you know, like, does yeah. it like, <laughs> ever go through your head? Like, I wonder what was in there. I have thought about that. The first one I did down in, uh, um, in Texas, I, I considered, you know, I'm in Seattle and so I buy out of state just cause Seattle, the, the prices are so high. Um, so I bought in Texas and I flew down there, did the, did the due diligence, found my team, you know, all that jazz, uh, bought the property. And, and when I, when I brought it on board, I already had guys set up to go out there and go through the units. And for a second, I was like, maybe I'll just fly down there and, uh, and go through them myself. Cause that there might be something cool in there, but my, uh, my logical brain kicked in. I was like, no, nah, man, not worth it. Just, just, <laughs> just dump it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, through your time of deal making favorite deal worst deal ever favorite deal worst deal all right that's a good one all right my favorite deal i'll start with the worst deal um the worst deal was probably the actually that first triplex i did um and that was just because i you know it was me and my friend and we knew nothing about what we were doing and we didn't know how to do due diligence we didn't know what to look for um we just saw this property it was priced well and we we're like all right let's buy it and so we bought it um we got lucky because seattle was going on a hockey stick in terms of the market and so that's how we made our money um we weren't like exceptional at flipping <laughs> flipping houses but um the deal it was a triplex it was in tacoma it was in the worst part of tacoma so that's one lesson right there is never buy anything in the worst part of any city um <laughs> we we bought this house it was uh it was kind of jumbled together. I think it used to be an old um, convenience store ish. And then they added on things and turned it into a house. And it was, just, it looked like a, a Frankenstein house um, and it was fully rented. Um, we thought that was great. But once we got the property, one of the tenants was a hoarder. Um, the other one we learned was uh, he was growing marijuana. And since it was the, you know, we were responsible for the electrical bill. It was like 600 bucks in electricity <laughs> and it was just killing us. <laughs> and yeah, I don't care if you grow marijuana, but do it on your own time. Um, and then the third one, what was wrong? Oh, the third one, it, he just stopped paying rent. And uh, we, you, you know, we had never dealt with that. I think we were, I was like 23 or something like that, 24. Um, and I, you know, we, we kicked him out we said, Hey, you have to go. Um, luckily we didn't have to go through the eviction process, but he got pissed off and he plugged the sink, turned on the faucet, flooded the entire place. And so it was just like one thing after the other was happening. Um, and you know, we took it in stride. We got, we got through it, but it was, uh, it was quite the lesson. So you made, you know, 40 grand, but you, uh, got some gray hairs out of it or got some stress, <laughs> yeah. some stress fractures. Yep. Um, in, in your journey, like what have you liked most about real estate investing in your, in your journey? Um, I mean, the reason I kind of stopped at real estate investing, you know, I'd, I'd done these different businesses and I, I found, I decided real estate was my home is because I love that it is a physical structure. Like there's an actual, it's a building that you can improve 
Um, and you can, it's, you can really sit back and like be proud of it. Um, with a lot of other types of businesses, it, especially like e-commerce, it was just really difficult for me to feel proud because I was, it's just a lot of, you know, numbers going across the screen and it's just not, not real. And so I really love the physicality of real estate, that it is a big, a biz, you know, building that you can improve and, uh, and, and, you know, improve the lives of those who engage with it. Yeah. You want to hear something funny, Gabe? You know how I said, sometimes when I ask a question, I forget that I even asked it. So we, we went over the worst deal. <laughs> I also <laughs> asked right. what was the best deal. I, I'm glad I wrote that down. So, uh, I love that you, you say you like real estate because it's actually physical. I can see it, touch it. I can make improvements, increase value. Right. So like it's with the logic mind, you can, you can touch it, feel it, move it, shake it, all the things. What was the best deal, uh, that you've ever done? Best deal. All right. Um, let's think the best deal I have done is probably just thinking through these ones. I mean, the, in terms of numbers, um, probably one of the, the second mobile home park I bought is the best, but in terms of what I enjoyed, um, this pre the, the most recent self storage that I bought down in Lubbock, Texas, um, it was great because it was like a full rehab. Um, I bought it dirt cheap, uh, but it was, you know, it was just a disgusting building and it was, uh, it was run down. There was just not something you would ever want to store your things in. Um, and we just got in there, we painted it, we uh, added security system, added fence. Um, we got some, some design work done for, for signs and the before and after picture for that one is awesome. Is it and, cool? uh, we're, we're actually getting it. Um, the university, the Texas tech called us and, and, uh, to get, uh, we're going to have a, an ad on their magnet that goes to all the students. Um, so it's really cool to just be part of the, the local community and, and it just, uh, it was, it was pretty rewarding. Yeah. That's super cool, man. So as you're doing deals and doing the interviews, like why did you start your podcast? The real estate investor, is it investors club or investing club? Yeah. The real estate investing club. Your head. Was um, in the way. Okay. The real estate investing club. Yeah. Why'd you start that? Uh, I really just wanted to talk with other investors. Like I, you know, when you first get started um, in investing, if, you, if you're trying to build a business, it's, it can be very, you know, isolating and you're, you're a solo entrepreneur. You're trying to go out there, you're trying to make it, even though real estate, another reason why I like it is because it is very relational. Um, even at the beginning, you know, you're kind of doing your own thing, kind of stuck out there. And so I really wanted to engage with other investors and understand what their asset class was like, um, you know, what they're doing, the struggles they're going through and, you know, the highs that they they've reached. And so I started it and it was, it's been exactly what I wanted. I, I love learning from other investors hearing, you know, what they've gone through, um, and, and where they've, they've reached in their careers. Yeah. So what does a day to day day <laughs> look like for you? Day to day. Uh, it is, it's very varied. <laughs> um, so I try to split things up between operations and sales. Um, and then the podcast podcast is always on Fridays. I just do all my social shit on Fridays and just, that's my day for, for social. Um, and then in the beginning of the week, I front load it with operations. So I, I meet with all my property managers, um, on Mondays. And then I do, I'll meet with like contractors and any, any type of, uh, you know, rehab work that's getting done on uh, Tuesday. Um, and then Wednesday through Wednesday and Thursday, I spend on new projects. So, um, from, you know, doing marketing, reaching out to sellers, uh, analyzing properties, putting offers out, stuff like that. Yeah. Being on other people's shows. Cause today's yep. Wednesday. So that's a new project for you. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. So you're, you're pretty organized. If in your closet, is everything organized by color or by <laughs> Not type? All, okay. man. My closet, my closet right now is just a mess. We moved. So me and my girlfriend, we, uh, um, we bought a, a tr uh, duplex down here in Tacoma that we're, we're flipping and we're actually living in it. That was a mistake. Don't ever live in a flip that you're doing because it is just, whew, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on here. There's a difference between fixing it for yourself versus fixing it for a tenant, right? Yep. Yep. Have you seen the movie Money Pit with uh, Tom Hanks back in the day? No, but people have said that's a good one. <laughs> oh yeah. So I remember, all right, I was going to do a real estate project with, with my buddies and I'm so glad I, this is the, sometimes the best deal you ever do is the deal you don't do. Right. <laughs> 
And I remember back in the day, we were looking at this real estate project and it was a single bed, you know, a single family home, three bed, two bath in our, in our area. And it was priced really right. And I was walking through and I got to the, the master bedroom and there was literally a hole in the floor and I could see dirt. Nice. Like, <laughs> so the guys and I were talking, we're like, okay, how much would it cost rehab? My, my dad was in construction. So I was like, you know, what are your thoughts? He's like, who's going to do all the work? And I was talking to my friends and it looked like I was going to do all the work. So I didn't like, do that. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> because my thought was I'll buy this for myself and rent it out to my buddies. Cause I had a condo of renting it out to a few buddies. So I was going to do this. So glad I passed on that deal. What was the deal from all your history? What is the deal that you're glad you didn't do? Oof, deal I'm glad I didn't do. Um, that's a good question. Deal I'm glad I didn't do. I think so when I was right after I, I got um, really into wholesaling, I, uh, you know, I knew some guys that owned rentals and I was like, you guys get money every, every month. That's awesome. I should do that. So I started to look for rentals that I could buy. Um, and Seattle at the time, I thought they were overpriced. I was an idiot. They were not overpriced. <laughs> now they uh, are. <laughs> yeah, now they are. Um, and so I went out to, uh, I started looking at markets that were priced better, in my opinion, at the time. So I went out to um, Anacortes, which is pretty far away from where we're at, and uh, or Aberdeen, sorry, Aberdeen, Washington. And these houses were like $10,000, $20,000, like really, really crappy houses. Um, and I almost bought a few, uh, I think it was, I was going to buy three houses for like $35,000. Um, but I'm really glad I didn't because man, that, that market is just markets matter. I know, you know, every, you can always make money in any market. That's absolutely true. Um, but the, it depends. Do you really want to, do you want to put in the effort required in a market that's not performing well? Um, and so I almost bought those houses out there in Aberdeen. Aberdeen has not improved at all since, I don't know, 1990. And so I'm just really glad I didn't go through that. All right. Speaking of 1990, so we're hanging out in Seattle, right? And you could ha hang out with the 1990s, you know, baseball player, Ken Griffey Jr., right? Because he's in <laughs> nice. Seattle, right? Good, good. Yeah. So we could hang out with him, right? Or we could hang out with the 2002-ish the Macklemore as he's going thrift store shopping also in seattle who would you rather hang out with for the day uh ken Griffey jr man he's a legend i would love to and i'm pretty he's a really good guy um macklemore is cool too I, that, that'd be a fun uh, a fun conversation but i think i'd choose ken yeah what would you what would you want to do with him all day besides play baseball right so you can't go play baseball all day <laughs> but you could hang out with him for a bit and ask him any question what what would you want to do and what question would you ask i'd probably play golf um and just kind of Golf, I love, golf's fun just because it's it's not too intensive and you can just kind of like you know walk around and talk to people yeah. um and i just want to know about you know his life like how did you get to the point where you are how did you get so good what was your like how did you decide baseball was the thing have you always been good at baseball like just what is how did your your life kind of grow up and did your dad who also played baseball go not as good as me you know like you, <laughs> were you competing with your dad this whole time yeah. right um now I saw when you lifted up your arm, you got some tattoos. Are 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 you comfortable talking about that? On, oh yeah. Uh, all right. What does that What does that say? I can't read that. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it goes back to the philosophy thing. It's Aristotle. Um, one says arte and one says uh, eudaimonia. Um, and it's kind of Aristotle's like philosophy kind of summed up into into a few words. Um, arte means excellence. Um, eudaimonia means uh, like wellness, well being. Uh, and Aristotle thought you could you know live a good life by you know, pursuing excellence and that would lead to a well, you know, well-lived life. Do you think that you, uh, as you interviewed 200 plus, uh, real estate investors, do you, do you see what makes a successful investor and what makes a non-successful investor based on Aristotle's views of excellence and good living? <laughs> uh, I think what makes a successful investor is just like grit and just deciding this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to go down this path and God damn it, I'm going to make it successful. <laughs> um, I can't really apply. I mean, I, I, Aristotle's philosophy works really well just because he's saying that whatever you do, you, you, you should do it well, do it to, you know, your, it should be purposeful and you should be doing it to the best of your abilities. Um, and that will lead to a good life. And, and obviously that's going to apply to anything you do. Um, uh, but specifically for real estate, I feel like you got to have grit and that's, that's the key is you just gotta, 
push through the obstacles um, because they're going to come up. Shit's going to hit the fan. It always hits the fan and it's always when you least expect it. Um, but you got to learn to just, you know, say, all right, whatever we're, we're going through this. It's going to be all right. Yeah. Now, have you ever like mathematically like envisioned what it would take for shit to actually hit the fan? So if you start from a <laughs> residential floor, that, that could be eight feet high. That's a lot for it to <laughs> actually hit to pile up and get that. Or you have the tenant who plugs the sink and floods the place, which could also cause shit to hit the fan. To What's, actually. Yeah, hit to fan. actually hit, hit the fan. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Right. So in the process of real estate investing, you have, you know, moved into mobile home parks and self storage, right? Do you find that it is more work, more meaningful, uh, tougher, easier than the residential or the first kind of wholesale deals? How's that in comparison? What do you like better or worse? Um, I commercial is awesome. I, I love commercial. I, I don't really like uh, residential and, you know, no offense to all the residential guys out there. Obviously it's a, it's a great place to be, but I, I just don't like, um, dealing with structures that people live in. And so it, there's so many, there's so much liability that that brings up. And there's also it, I feel bad when I have to like evict somebody. Um, I'm, I'm like a, a, a a capitalist that doesn't really want to be a capitalist. <laughs> like I have a lot of compassion in me and I don't, I don't want to, you know, kick somebody out when they're, you know, they, maybe they've had a hard time, um, but you got to do that if you're in multifamily or anything like that, because that, you know, people will take advantage of you. So I really like self-storage. I like commercial for that reason is that you're, you're dealing with, it's kind of business to business. Um, and self-storage is more of like a product. It's more of a, uh, a service that you're giving out to people. Um, I like that. And I just like, on the commercial side, things scale so much easier. And I cannot stress this enough. Um, it doesn't take that much more effort to buy and stabilize, you know, a 200, 500 unit self-storage facility than it does to buy a couple, you know, single family houses. So do you want to go through and buy one single family house and make 500, $1,000 a month? Or do you want to buy a 500, 500, you know, unit self-storage facility and, uh, and make, you know, 10 times that amount. Yeah. You know, I started in my real estate journey, you know, in construction, and then I moved over to uh, real estate and real estate brokerage and investing in spec and all this other crap. But I remember one of my first deals was a, you know, I was working the floor as a realtor, you know, answering phone calls. And I wound up listing a mobile home, not mobile home park, a mobile home in the Ocala National Forest, which was a 40 minute drive for 32 grand, right? Okay. I worked my butt off yep. and I made a $300 commission, I think, Yeah. right? And then I wound up doing a wholesale, knocked on doors and I flipped a contract for 14 grand. Yep. It was so much easier to work with investors for me than it is to work with grandmas or grandpas or people who care if the house is pink or blue or yep. whatever. Yep. Me personally, I like commercial and I like investors. I don't yep. deal well with homeowners. Yep. No, I'm right. right in the same boat, man. <laughs> so we might be twin brothers. I'm on the East Coast and you're on the West Coast. So we might be twins. There, in we're sandwiching it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does the future look like for you? Is there a specific number you're going after? Are you going to try to kick back your you know, shoes and you know, live on a beach somewhere? Like, Where are you going and uh, how do you know you won? No beaches in, in Seattle, so I can't do that. But um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just liking what I'm doing. It's, I'm having a blast. So I'm we're uh, just going to keep going down the same road. Um, I want to close probably three or four self-storage facilities this year. Um, I do like self-storage. Uh, I eventually will want to move out. I, you know, um, strip center retail sounds fun to me. Um, you know, re buying a shitty one, flipping it, that sounds like a, just sounds like a fun, fun time to me. Um, so eventually I kind of want to try that. Uh, but yeah, just keep going down the same path. The podcast, I'm having, having a blast doing that. And so, um, there's no real goal for the podcast. I know, you know, everybody who has a podcast has, has, uh, has great goals and, uh, you know, you guys are doing a great job too, but I just, I don't have a goal for my podcast. I'm just enjoying talking to the people that I'm, that I'm talking with. Um, and I'm going to keep going down that path. 
what was one of the best experiences you've had on a podcast interview? You've done 200 of them, which is awesome. <laughs> Great job, man. What is one of the best and worst experiences you ever had? You don't have to mention names or anything like that, but like, give me a scenario where it was awesome and another scenario that was terrible. Yeah. The worst ones are just, are always, um, just people who, Oh no, there was one that, that was pretty bad. And it was because the guy I was, he was doing the interview, um, in his closet while the house was being worked on, you know, there's construction going on. And so it was just every two minutes, just, um, so that was probably the worst, you know, it's not that bad, but the best, Oh, it was this, I can't remember his name. Dang it. Um, I wish I could, cause he did a really good interview and what he, yeah, how we, how we got started in real estate was he flipped farms. And so he would buy farms. Um, I can't remember how, what he did to them, but somehow he would buy the farm, he'd fix the dirt and he'd flip it to a, a new type of farmer. And it just blew my mind. I was like, man, you really can do absolutely everything in real estate. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, I've uh, I flipped cows and you know went cow tipping before, but I've never flipped <laughs> oh, a farm. <laughs> you know, I'm in Central Florida in a place called Ocala, so uh, we grew up with you know horse patties and such like that, cow patties. Nice, um, awesome, man. Yeah. So let, let's do this, right? So we have a a PR company and a mastermind group for podcast hosts and, and such like that. Let's do this. Give a piece of advice for people who want to be on your show, what are some do's and don'ts for people who want to be on the real estate investing clubs podcast? Oh, nice. Um, I mean, I, I get a lot of people that reach out that want to be on the podcast, but they don't actively do investing. And that's like the, that's, that's the bare minimum. You got to be an investor. You got to be out there in the field. Um, otherwise you're just not going to have a lot of talk about, I mean, it's, you know, no offense to everybody out there, but there's a lot of, uh, um, like mortgage brokers who want to be on the show and mortgage more pro mortgage brokers. We need you. You, you provide a great service and we appreciate you. Uh, but it's not, you know, not super pertinent to investing, although, you know, you guys provide the capital. Um, but you gotta, you gotta be out there in the field and that's like the, the bare minimum. Um, outside of that, it is just having a good story, being able to go into your story and talk about, you know, the ups, the downs. Um, we want to hear about both. And, uh, and that's the, you know, the downs really is really what makes your, what brings color to your, to your life. Um, so you got to be able to go into, you know, both sides of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, de deals go wild sometimes. Yeah, and if we don't talk about them, then we're, we're never going to learn right as a community, right? We have yeah. a podcast show and people are listening because they want to be entertained and they want to be educated, you know? So it's like, if we're not talking about our freaking failures and how we lost a bunch of money here or there or gone bankrupt or this or that, then how are we going to learn together? Um, yeah. What is yeah, the... I, I like to, I, like so many people when they just got, get started in, in real estate and they see all these guys who have a portfolio um, and, you know, they're not sweating it now that they have the portfolio. They don't understand that, like, I, I swear every single person I talk to, we've gone through the point where we had no money. There was a long time where I was just, I didn't even know if I could make the mortgage and I, I'm not trying to like be hyperbolic here, but it was just, I was scraping by and I didn't, I was nervous all or anxious all the time. And so it's just good to go through to show people who are in that situation that, Hey man, we've gone through it. You can make it out. Just keep pushing. Um, you're going to make it. And sometimes go get a job, right? Go and get yeah, a, get a, a part-time job real somewhere yep. that, you know, like just keep food on the tables because deal makers. So, this is an interesting thing. Deal makers, I deal better when there's a certain amount of money in my bank account, mm, right? Yep. I'm better at deal making. I'm better at negotiating. I could sit on a deal. But when, man, when that gets low or that goes red, holy moly, I turn into a bad deal maker. People can yep. sense the anxiety, whatever the case may be. Do you find that to be the case when you went through that scenario? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember I took, uh, I took a deal and I, I was just desperate to get, you know, get a flip because I had the money and I, I, I knew I needed to get something done or else I was just going to keep working in corporate. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I took this flip from a guy. Um, he, he wanted too much for his property and I knew this and I was like, Sh I shouldn't do this, but I'm, you know, I really need to do a flip. And so he wanted too much and I just kept trying to negotiate with him. Um, and eventually we landed on, okay, you can sell it to me for, um, I think it was like 85,000, uh, which, 
you know, this is a long time ago. It was 85,000. And, uh, but he wanted to split the profit once I sold it. Um, and I agreed to this and that was the dumbest thing I've ever done because when, once I did, you know, did flip it and I did all the work, you know, it was me and a partner. We did all the work ourselves with our hands, not all of it, but a lot of the work. And so we put so much effort into this. And when it came time to the time to sell the property, um, we had disagreements on how to, to, um, how to calculate the profit from the property. And he, obviously he had a shit ton of money. This, he was another investor. So, and he wanted to take us to court we couldn't do that. And so we were just like, fuck it. We're just gonna, you know, you can have all this money and we're gonna, we'll take this. And, um, but that happened because I, I took a deal that I shouldn't have taken. And I yeah. did that because I didn't have enough money in the bank. Yeah. And so yeah, this is awesome. Getting into the deal, getting your hands dirty in the deal too, where it's just like, you have to go get the house, fix up the house, paint and scrape and do all these things. And then you're like, oh shoot, we tore off the drywall and now there's electrical issues or plumbing issues. Or now we, you know, like, cause there's a lot of stuff. What advice do you have for other beginner real estate investors when they're exploring a residential fix and flip? <laughs> don't do flips. I'm telling you, unless you're a contractor, uh, just don't do them. It's not, it's not worth it. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're determined and you want to do a flip, uh, I would say first, don't do the work yourself. Uh, it's, it's just, even if you're saving some money, it's not going to look good. I remember that house that, that I was just talking about. Um, I did the tile work, the floor tile work. And, uh, we, I can't remember. We had to have a contractor come in and do something. It was something electrical. Um, he was walking around and he looked at the tile work and he's like, Oh man, who did you hire for that? That is a horrible job. You should, you know, you shouldn't have hired him. And I was like, shit, that was me. Um, but you know, I didn't have the skills and that's just what it was. And so when you're doing a flip, you really need to hire, you need to hire it out. Um, you need to hire most of the work out in order for it to look, you know, professional. And to do that, you need to get at least three bids per job. Um, and then you'll get the lowest one, yada, yada. But the first, first rule, I would say, just don't do a flip. Just don't do a flip unless you're a contractor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Golly. I understand that so much. All right. So uh, part of my show, I have a, a deck of cards with questions on it because my limited brain can only come up with a certain amount of questions. <laughs> You're doing right? great so far. I'm impressed. So many questions. <laughs> well, thank you. Hey, I am super <laughs> honored by another podcaster who has given me a compliment. So yeah. uh, tell me when to stop and I'm going to ask you the question. And stop. All right. Ready? The question. Ooh. <laughs> In your biography... Which chapters would you ask your parents to skip? Which chapters would I ask my parents to skip? Yeah. Uh, probably, I mean, it's not, probably when I was in high school, we just, I just drank too much with my friends and I did stupid things. And that's probably something I would, I would choose for them to, to skip. Yeah. Got it. All right. Now we turn your biography into a movie. Who's going to play Gabe in your, in your movie about your oh, life? Man. That is a good question, man. I, I really love the rock. He looks nothing like me and he's, he, he's not a fit at all, but I would love for the rock to play me. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hey rock, I know you're listening to my podcast show. <laughs> Gabe is, is interviewing people to play his uh, movie. So you could apply. Maybe he'll take <laughs> Come on, one. Dwayne. You know, you want to <laughs> Do you hear what the rocks got cooking. All right. So, as you're, as you're building out your podcast show, like what is something that you love about be having a podcast show and what's something that you could totally do without? Um, I mean, obviously the love is, I just love talking to the, to other investors. Um, it is amazing when you're, when you're kind of working on your business, you get focused on your business. And so you get really good at self-storage and building the business around self-storage. Um, and you, and you really don't understand all of these other things that are out there that are that are um, pertinent to this, the field that you're in. And so when I talk to people who are in multifamily or in, um, you know, warehouses or, you know, anything like that, that's completely different. And I hear how they run their business, how they analyze their business. Um, it kind of opens my eyes to, to different worlds. And I love hearing from them. Um, I really like hearing their, their ups and downs. I've said that before, but it's just great to hear that, you know, other, 
we're all going through the same thing. It's, you know, real estate is, uh, you often feel like you're, you're on, you're the only person out there, you and your team. Um, but everybody, all the other investors, we're all going through the same thing. And so it's great to kind of reach out, connect to other people and, and, uh, and share stories. Yeah. There's a second part to that question. I forgot what it was. Yeah, me too. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what did you, what do you love about it? What do you, what could you do without? Uh, that's what I, wait, that's what I love about it. What could I do without? Okay. Um, technical stuff. Oh man. There's, you know, you hear a podcast, listening to a podcast, all you hear is two people talking to each other. It sounds simple, right? You're just talking into a mic, but there's so much shit that goes behind the podcast. It's just, there's so much technical stuff. I got VAs helping me, but it's still like, it's, it's a, that I could do without is the technical side. Yeah. So I, I love this and I'm so glad you're a podcast host because this is, it, it's fun. What, what do you think? So you're, you're a podcast host and you've actually been on other people's shows. What yeah. makes a good podcast host? So what advice do you have for other people who are like, Hey, I'm going to build a podcast show and such like what, what are some things that make a good host or a shitty one? Yeah. Um, I, I think honestly, I'm, and I'm not just trying to try to, you know, uh, uh, kiss up to you on your show. I think you're doing a great job because you're, you're genuinely curious. And I think that's what makes a really good, um, podcast host is being curious and being able to ask good questions and keep the conversation flowing. Um, it's hard to like, yeah, I mean, I know, you know, this at some points, especially if the, if the guest, maybe it's at the end of the day and, and the guest is tired or something like that. And the conversation just isn't flowing. It's hard to keep that momentum. Um, and being able to, to come up with questions and, and ask, you know, pointed questions, um, and connect with the hosts, that's, that's hard stuff. And so that's what makes the good, the good host from the bad host. Yeah, bro. You've given me two compliments so far. You've got one more to go before <laughs> I, before I get, send you that Amazon gift card. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so as, as we're doing this, like, who do you have, like, out of all the guests that you've had, or maybe a guest, like a future guest, who's that guest that you're like, I want to interview them. Who is that person? Oh man. Besides the rock or right. Ken Griffey Jr. Well, or Mac Dwayne, Mac. you're always invited on my podcast. Just, I'll just let you know that. Um, but besides the rock, it would be, um, so rich dad, poor dad was the, the book that kind of like got me into this yeah. and I, it'd be cool to have Robert Kiyosaki on the, on the podcast. Um, he's, I think he's at a, a level that I just wouldn't be able to relate to at right now. Um, and so that it might be difficult. So maybe it'd be better to get somebody that's still on the ground. Um, and so let's see, is there a big self storage guy? Um, oh man, I don't know anybody from, you know, the top, top 10, eh, maybe not top 10, five, the top five through 10 self storage, uh, companies out there just to hear kind of how they, their trajectory. Um, you know, they started somewhere. I'd like to hear how they got from their first self storage facility to 1 million square feet of, uh, of self storage. Sometimes the shit that comes to my brain, like when I'm interviewing someone, like the dumbest jokes in the world, I don't know if this happens to you, but I, as I was thinking about like a self storage, like, you know, like how Grant Cardone or these guys, they walk around with their phone and they're talking about deals and such like that. Like, it's so damn literal to take a selfie in front of a self storage thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so ridiculous. That's like, good. how does that I even, should, like, I should make that, that joke <laughs> on my stuff. Uh, it's, it's a dad joke. It's a bad dad joke. It's a good, I, dad, yeah. good dad joke, actually. <laughs> right, thank Man, you. that's actually, and it's good uh, for people out there who have like, um, self storage is a good example because it's very, uh, it's very commercial almost, like it's a product. Um, and so you're really connecting with the actual customer and not like somebody living in your property. Um, and so when you put up posts, like that would be a great, like Google my business post. Um, just to kind of get you up in the rankings so people interact with it is just do a shitty joke like that. Put it on your Google My Business. That would, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah. That just came out of like left field, like <laughs> hanging out with Ken Griffey back there and it just popped out of there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I got to stop Love drinking it. on the job over here. So uh, Gabe, as, as we're rounding out the, uh, the basis here and uh, the conversation, what's a question that I should have asked you that I screwed up and didn't ask you? <laughs> Uh, the question you should have asked me, that is a good question. And, um, what is the question that you should have asked me? You know, I don't have an answer for that. I would say, stumped. Um, I'm stumped. 
Um, maybe, uh, let's see. How about one something that I always ask on my podcast is where people are excited to invest in, um, because there there's tons of places out there to invest. Uh, and so I'm going to ask myself that question, where, where's the place that I want to invest in? Um, and right now I am super focused on Texas, Arkansas, and Alabama. Cool. Texas, yeah. Arkansas, and Alabama. Yeah. Uh, my son was born in Dallas, Texas. So we, he's a Texan. We are proud of the the beautiful country of Texas and Florida uh, in the Southeast. We love uh, we love our, our families down there. Um, but yeah, Texas is a cool place. What, what part of Texas do you, or do you have any investments in now? Uh, I got two just outside of Fort Worth. Um, I got one in, two outside of Fort Worth and then one in, in Lubbock um, cool. in the North, yeah. Have you gone to uh, the Gaineses? Um, oh, property? Magnolia? Yeah. Yeah, their Magnolia thing? It's no, but my girlfriend loves their uh, their new channel, the Magnolia Network or whatever. Yeah. Um, they I haven't, but I have I would love to go to the silos. They're in like Frisco or something like that, right? Uh, no, where's that place? Well, first of all, I'm terrible at directions, but I think it was that place, <laughs> Waco, where there was Waco, the, the, yeah. the, the crazy people back in the day. I yep. think it's around there. Someone's right. going to correct me and like send me a hundred messages of how dumb I am. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm wrong a lot. You know, I stand in line, guys. My wife tells me that all the time. So, um, all right, cool. So next time you're in Texas, yeah, go visit there. Fort Worth is cool. The stock, the stocker, the stockyards. Have you been to stockyards? I haven't, no. Mm. And then you got to go to like a, one of the Bucky's gas stations. I, somebody told me to do that. I haven't done it yet. I've all, I only went out there like a few times. Um, I, I'm a bad investor. I need to go out there more often. But, uh, <laughs> but listen, but, when you go there, you have to wear, you know, cowboy boots with the long pointed toes. You have to wear <laughs> a huge hat and uh, you have to like dress like a cowboy, man. You have to fit in if you're going go to go to stockyards. Yeah, cool. Get the, get the shirt with the little, uh, little twinkling on them. Yeah, man. I like it. We'll carry around a lasso. So uh, Gabe, where could people go to connect with you? to listen to your uh, podcast and maybe connect with you and do a real estate deal? Uh, the best place is the Real Estate Investing Club. So the real estate investing with an ING club.com. That's our website. And uh, we have, um, I think there's a button on there that says invest with us. Uh, we are actively looking for deals. We have two that we're working on right now, um, self-storage deals. And that's our, that's our game. So uh, we're always looking for investors. If you guys want to jump on the self-storage train, we would love to have you. Choo-choo. All right. So fellow dealmakers, thank you for listening into the Deal Scout. As always, reach out to our guests. Their contact information will be in the show notes below. Uh, connect directly with them. Tell them you heard them on the Deal Scout. And if you want to do a deal, looking for a deal, and want to talk about it here on the show, head on over to thedealscout.com. Fill out a quick form and get you on the show next. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. See you, everybody.